Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Dan Dickens here, pastor of the Monroe United Methodist Church in Monroe, Iowa. Welcome to today's devotional for Ash Wednesday. I invite us to begin our time with prayer. O God, our Deliverer, you led your people of old through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. Guide now the people of your church that, following our Savior, we may walk through the wilderness of this world toward the glory of the world to come, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In 1854, Frederick Faber wrote one of the truly lovely hymns that we have today. In his short life of only 49 years, he wrote 150 hymns, grew up a strict Calvinist, anti-Roman Catholic, he attended Oxford and later became an Anglican priest, only to feel that there was a poverty in that branch of Christianity when it came to liturgy and formal worship. And so he eventually converted to, you guessed it, Catholicism and became a priest in London. I guess it goes to show that no one's path is the same as others. His had many twists and turns, but through it all, we find Faber's declaration of the boundless love of God and God's great mercy to all. His song, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. There's a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. There is kindness in God's justice, which is more than liberty. There is welcome for the sinner, and more graces for the good. There is mercy with the Savior, there is healing in His blood. For the love of God is broader than the measure of our mind, and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. If our love were but more simple, we should rest upon God's word. And our lives would be illumined by the presence of our Lord. Well, as I said, today is Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent. The season of Lent, as you may remember, begins a journey as we follow our Lord to Jerusalem, to Calvary, to his passion on the cross, and the depth of God's love and mercy for you and me. Observing the season of Lent means accepting the fact, then, that we stand in the need of grace, that our lives are far from perfect. It means being willing to bear our soul to the Lord, the reality of our sins, and the times when our trust in Him has faltered. The premise in doing so is that only by being brutally honest with ourselves and with God can we truly begin to understand the depth of God's love and the extent to which our Lord will go to redeem us from the pit we've fallen into. One of the traditional passages Christians often hear uh, read on Ash Wednesday comes from the prophet Joel. In chapter 2 of his book, we find these words, beginning in verse 12. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts, and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent, and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. 
Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children, even infants at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, Where is their God? It must have been a devastating experience for Joel and his people to be so overwhelmingly overrun by, of all things, an army of locusts. The Bible often speaks of spiritual forces warring against us. Well, in this case, it was an agricultural war, if you will. It came in the form of locusts, millions upon millions of locusts that ruined crops. Trees had been stripped bare of their leaves, and even the bark was gone. The olive trees were ruined. The grain was eaten up completely. The vineyards had been reduced to stubble. All the pomegranates, the palm, the apple trees, completely devastated. While it wasn't a human army, well, it was just as bad, if not worse, leaving nothing behind, a scorched earth, leaving behind a broken people. Now, I've never seen a swarm of locusts, have you? I've heard of them. The nearest experience I have had are mosquitoes. In the deep south, they are the bane of existence, thriving in the hot human climate. There are days when you simply cannot go outside, especially if you live near the water where they breed. But even they cannot compare with the locusts of Joel. Joel saw a connection then between the lives his people had been living and the devastation of the land. They had forgotten their God. Like all people of faith, Joel wrestled with the calamity, what the locusts had done, and he concluded that it was God's punishment for the sins of his people. Well, you and I struggle to make sense out of the many misfortunes we face in life, too, and we know from Christ's teachings that God's desire is not to destroy, but to save. In the Gospel according to Luke, Jesus is asked if a wall that fell and killed 18 people was because of their sins, and he plainly says, no. But, like the prophet Joel, Jesus sees this tragedy and other calamities as an opportunity to remind his people to live holy lives, lest they suffer a similar fate. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. In the end, it is crystal clear that God wants each of us to turn to him in truth, in honesty, in humility, and in sincerity to seek and to live according to his ways. When we do, we experience forgiveness and healing, like the giving of grain and wine and oil and the complete restoration of the land that Joel promised the Lord would do. You and I will experience a renewed relationship with a loving God who is always after our best interests. I love how in chapter 2, verse 21, Joel offers hope even to the soil and the animals, talking to them as if to us. He bends down to the ground and says, Don't be afraid, dirt. It's going to be all right. He turns to the squirrel and says, Don't be frightened, little squirrels. The trees will come back. The acorns will grow. He assures them as if to assure us too. But the plagues that befall us, they'll go away. And we will praise the name of the Lord our God, who has dealt wondrously with you. Friends, I encourage you to take the opportunity God gives you to lead a godly life. What do you need to do in order to be a better witness to the Lord? In what ways do you wish you were more loving, more kind, more forgiving, more gracious? What areas in your conduct need to change? What ways of relating to others do you wish were different? Are you willing to take this to the Lord in prayer? Are you willing to do what it takes? Are you ready to let God do for you what only God can do? Then come with me and walk in God's ways. And as we do, 
He will make his ways our ways. If our love were but more simple, we should rest upon God's Word, and our lives would be illumined by the presence of our Lord. Well, may God richly bless and keep you, making you whole and complete in the way that leads to life eternal. May God lift you up and give you peace through Christ our Savior, and with His Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen.